All right. Uh, should I get started? Is there? A, ah, okay. There's a tissue. <laughs> Okay. I thought we were just. Uh... <laughs> yeah, let's get started for the last lecture on cosmology. All right. So. So let's uh, briefly review what we uh, have been discussing. So, the first two lectures. Here is the beginning end of inflation eta going to minus infinity, eta going to zero. So the first two lectures were about this diagram here, spontaneous pair production and uh, the power spectrum of two scalar fluctuations. And then yesterday we discussed this diagram here that comes from self-interactions. Eta going to zero. And then we we pointed out that it satisfies a, a nice uh, soft limit, <clears throat> like Weinberg's soft limit, and um, that in slow row inflation, this is very small. Uh, but for all single field models, this uh, three point function is essentially vanishing around the squeezed configuration, which one of the modes has much longer wavelength than the two other modes. So the question today is, can we use this as some sort of uh, LHC, as a particle detector? Or at least th this will be part of the, of the lecture today. And uh, so we're going to talk a little bit more about scalar fluctuations, but maybe for the first 15 minutes. And then for the rest of the lecture, I, I want to talk about tensors, because tensors are the future targets of um, experimental effort. So actually, the thing that people want to measure is the tensor to scalar ratio. The theory is essentially done, modulo a complication that I'll uh, explain to you. There's some theoretical uh, problem in, in if we detect tensors, how to make sense of it within uh, effective field theory. So I'll uh, briefly review why. But then I want to uh, f move on to more, uh, you know, future things. Once we measure tensors, can we measure more than just the tensor power spectrum or, or the amplitude of the tensor power spectrum? So, so that's the plan. So the first thing um, I want to do is to consider this diagram here. So we learn information about uh, inflaton self-couplings when we measure this type of diagram. So the question is, uh, and the other thing that we wrote is that this bispectrum B of K1, K2, K3, around the squeeze configuration, which is K1, K2, K3. So I had a, a nonsense for it yesterday. So mm -mm. K3, I called the, and that's what I wanted to check. K3, K1, and K2. So the limit K3 goes to zero. I was writing it um, like the power spectrum of the long modes, the power spectrum of the short modes, and then some series a n n zero to infinity k three over k one yeah. and uh, a zero and a one give me no new information. Okay, so I'm just. Uh, Remeasuring features of the power spectrum. They are determined by the power spectrum. So A2 is new info. A2, A3, and so on. Okay. Starting from A2, maybe AJ, J, 
All right. Um, so there is an assumption that uh, there is a nice uh, Taylor expansion in this um, in this uh, ratio k3 over k1, and uh, yeah, some sort of analyticity assumption. And I'll show you today that this uh, breaks down uh, if there are other there if there are other fields around. So the the slogan is cosmological collider physics. So you want to use Inflation as a particle detector. So let's consider the, the following situation. So we have some extra field sigma of mass M and spin S. Okay? And then uh, this, uh, this extra field couples to the, um, to the inflationary fluctuations. So it, and uh, then these inflationary fluctuations decay, and I, I'm still measuring the bispectrum. So that's K, uh, that's K1, K2, K3. So I have a bispectrum. And the question is, what, what does the bispectrum look like if this is happening, if there is a particle of mass M and spin S mediating the, the generation of this bispectrum, okay? So, uh, one thing, recall that in, um, in the sitter space, there, the, so let's contrast. I said this in the previous lectures, but let, uh, let's remind ourselves. So in flat space, the representation theory breaks down into massless and massive representations. In, in particular, so there's no intrinsic uh, uh, mass scale. So it doesn't make sense to talk about heavy or light particles. They're either massless or massive. And um, in terms of the number of degrees of freedom, massless particles have two degrees of freedom. Massive particles have two S plus, uh, plus one degrees of freedom. Uh, in the sitter, something different happens. So now we have the Hubble scale. So there is a notion of um, light. There's a notion of uh, heavy. And there, and there are, let me call them massless with a quote. There are degrees of freedom that somehow don't have a, a simple flat space uh, interpretation. Their, their masses are certain multiples of the Hubble scale in such a way that they actually carry uh, a number of degrees of freedom which is uh, in between uh, 2s plus 1 and 2. So these guys here will carry 2s plus 1 degrees of freedom. But then there are certain values of mass for which I, I, instead of jumping from 2s plus 1 to 2, I actually go down by, by steps. Okay? So there are um, steps all the way down to 2. So this is a little bit weird, and this is called uh, uh, these uh, fields that satisfy this relation. They are um, they are called members of the discrete series of the representation of the De Sitter group, and uh, they are also referred to as partially massless particles. Yeah. So there is um, so there are Casimirs of the De Sitter group, and uh, one of the so there are two Casimirs, and you associate one of them. With, uh, so there will be uh, linear combinations of the mass parameter in the Lagrangian and the spin parameter in the Lagrangian. So I'm just calling it like by association with the mass parameter in the Lagrangian. And, but there are again two Casimirs, and so 
we associate with them mass and spin. Yeah, yeah, there's some partial gauge symmetry that protects uh, their mass. Okay. Well, let, let me let me let me define them and then I'll, I'll explain how they're. Um, That's here. So, so we did this for uh, massless, for for spin zero. Sorry, in lecture one. So we have here M. And then there are two special values, zero and um, and the square root. Of, yeah, the massless case, the spin zero case, is a little bit weird. So these are special values of the mass. So let me use uh, uh, three different colors. So these I would call members of the discrete series. Uh, then for, for scalars, of course, all, the, all fields have the uh, same number of degrees of freedom, but uh, as you see, the mode functions have a special behavior for uh, the members of the discrete series. So then there is a range here up to three halves to H, which is called the complementary series. And then uh, once the mass is bigger than this factor of H here, so a factor order one times H, this is called the principal series. So these are heavy fields. So let me illustrate this uh, uh, weird phenomenon here for spin two, where this was, I think, first uh, recognized by Higuchi in the 80s. So for spin two, here's the mass, here's zero, the graviton, and, um, and the principal series is different color. And uh, of course here's forbidden. So now for spin two, there's something interesting that happens. So now at square root of two times H, there is again a member of the discrete series. And uh, then the, actually the values are the same, it's kind of an accident. It's not always the same values of uh, three halves H. And the weird thing now is that this mass range is forbidden. So you can't have light. So there is some mass gap in which uh, the representations will not be unitary. This is forbidden. And uh, this range here is the complementary series. And this range here is the principal. Okay. So in terms of number of degrees of freedom, so these guys here, the complementary and principal series, they have uh, uh, five degrees of freedom, like a massive spin two field would have. So this guy here has two degrees of freedom, like the graviton should have. But now this guy here has four. 
So this is called a, I don't know, partially massless graviton. So it's just a, an oddity of, uh, of uh, the Sitter representation theory. So there is some, there is some partial gauge symmetry. So uh, of course, what makes the, the graviton uh, Lagrangian have only two degrees of freedom is, is this, so for the graviton uh, m equals to zero, there is h mu nu going to h mu nu, something like this. That reduces the number of degrees of freedom. And for m equals to root 2 times h, so there is some gauge freedom that removes only one degree of freedom, something like, let me call this um, h. times y. So there is a scalar uh, gauge symmetry that removes one degree of freedom. Okay. So this, uh, this type of Lagrangian is allowed in the serial representation theory. So that's what removes. So it's, a, it's called partial gauge symmetry. I don't know, does that answer your question? So for all higher spin fields, you will have uh, this uh, type of game. So let's say it's uh, spin four. So you start, so heavy fields will have uh, nine degrees of freedom. Then for a certain uh, range of, you have a, a, a forbidden band, but in between the nine degrees of freedom and the two degrees of freedom of the massless spin four field, you have uh, islands, just specific values of the mass for which you will interpolate. You go from nine to eight, to six, to four, to two degrees of freedom. Okay. So these are called partially massless fields. They were uh, studied extensively by Stanley Dazer and uh, Andrew Waldron. So it's, it's very interesting. So let me just uh, write the formula for higher spins. Spin three, four, etc. So if m squared is bigger than or equal than s minus a half squared h squared, I should probably use color the principal series, then uh, s, s minus one h squared less than m squared less than s minus a half squared squared. Then it's the complementary series. And then uh, the members of the discrete series satisfy m squared equals s times s minus 1 minus t, t plus one times h squared. So these are the members of the discrete series. So t is a, an extra label of the representation and this is called the depth. And it ranges, as you can see from this formula, it ranges from zero to s minus one. So it only starts being interesting, you only start having different depths at um, spin greater than or equal to two, okay? Mm -hmm. All right. So let me show you how the mode functions behave. And that will essentially uh, answer this question. Of, uh, so the point is that around the squeeze limits, I'm, I'm going to be probing the, the, the mode function of this extra field floating around. So if I understand the, how the mode function behaves, I'm more or less done 
and so on. So if you're uh, ADS-CFT minded, the behavior of the mode functions have to do with the conformal dimension of, uh, of the fields. And if you recall, so let's uh, do a box here. So in ADS, the, this formula gives me the, the dimension of the representations, right? And uh, for, so delta will satisfy its unitarity bounds. So bulk unitarity and uh, boundary unitarity are identified. In DS, Recall the, the analytic continuation that I described in the first lecture that takes you from ADS to DS. You take R ADS to I times uh, one over H. So this will flip sign delta, delta minus three is minus M squared. I'm doing this just for the scalars. There's, a, there's some formula for uh, fields of spin. But now uh, unitary DS gives a non-unitary CFT. In particular, the weights can be complex valued. Okay, for it's not easy to, it's not hard to uh, convince yourself that if this is a very heavy field of mass much bigger than Hubble, then uh, delta will just be uh, proportional to I times M over H. Okay, so. And the mode functions at late times, they essentially decay as eta to the delta. Okay, so the, the mode functions at late times, there's some coefficient here, but you just sum over the conformal dimensions, eta to the delta, c to the delta, just like in ADS-CFT. Okay. So let, let me just make a plot. Yeah, so in ADS-CFT, you, you, you control one of, the, one of the powers and the other is a response. Here, I just set up the initial states at early times and then at late times, uh, at late times, both, both uh, modes are present, okay? One will usually decay and the other will survive, but uh, there are examples, for example, heavy fields uh, both modes decay at the same rates, but they oscillate. So both modes are present. So let me call this uh, phi and um, eta. So I'm going from minus infinity to zero. So for so there's some horizon crossing moment. Uh, recall that this is when k eta is uh, order one. And then after that, uh, let me be consistent with the color. So members of the discrete series will just uh, have, uh, well, in particular, the massless field will keep the amplitude constant. That's why the power spectrum uh, survives at late times. Then members of the complementary series, they decay, but they have tails. So they just decay smoothly. So members of the complementary series will decay like this. So M and uh, from from this formula here, you see that there will be oscillations for members of the principal series. So for members of the principal series. Oh, this is a bad uh, drawing. So there will be some decay, but moreover there will be oscillations. So, so M 
Moreover, uh, one, another thing that I must say about these heavy fields, remember that in the first lecture, uh, just a second, I'll take your question. So uh, heavy fields, they have a nice particle interpretation. You can see them, you can think of them as uh, being created by a thermal box in the Decider temperature. So there will be a Boltzmann factor. So not only they are, not, not only they are decaying and oscillating, but also the amplitude of the mode for a given value of mass will decay like e to the minus pi m over h, okay? So when you square this, you'll give you e to the minus m over the temperature of the sitter. So this is like e to the minus m over Tds over 2, okay? Question? Yeah, so all, all, all massless particles of higher spin are members of the discrete series. Not that I'm aware of, yeah. It, uh, it relies on Lorentz invariance. So, oh, in part, I would say that uh, Vasiliev theory uh, in particular is a counter example, right? It's because it's an interacting theory of uh, massless higher spin fields. So it evades Weinberg with them in a contrived, it's a very rigid theory. It's not clear that it's easily deformable. Or we don't know of uh, many examples, but yeah, I think that when there is cosmological constant, you can have interacting theories of uh, higher spin fields, massless higher spin fields. Okay, so the, this factor of exponential damping is important because of course, if the mass is very big compared to the Hubble scale, then uh, this amplitude dies off really fast, right? So you don't expect this field to propagate for very long before it decays into the inflationary fluctuations. So uh, I want to make this point just to say that we have some range of masses for which this is a, a good particle detector. So let me just keep this diagram here. So I would claim that uh, the cosmological collider is efficient for M order Hubble. Because if M is much less than Hubble, then uh, the power spectrum of these fields should survive. Okay. Should survive. So if they, in particular, if they're scalar fields, you, we should see them around. So if it's much less than Hubble, then you need to somehow make them uh, generate this uh, non-Gaussianity, but not affect the constraints on uh, other modes floating around. So we basically just see the adiabatic mode. So you need to suppress the power spectrum of this uh, field. So M much less than H, they do generate the type of uh, non-local, uh, non-Gaussianity that we're seeing here. But um, one needs to explain why we don't observe, at least, it seems natural that one should observe first uh, the power spectrum of the sigma field. For M much bigger than H, then these guys don't propagate for very long. Their amplitude decays fast. So you would imagine that the diagram, it's uh, the idea of integrating it out. Okay? So the field is very heavy. We can integrate it out. We're just going to generate some analytic contact vertices, so you would imagine that this is well approximated by just a contact interaction. So then you won't be able to really do spectroscopy. You will be indistinguishable, the signature from this field here, from the signature just of a contact interaction. Because it decays so fast, you don't have enough time to, to see this modulation. That's the point. 
for M order H, then you will see something. And uh, let me describe to you what we'll see. And then we'll move on to, to tensors. Because I want to do some uh, tensors. Otherwise, we're going to do cosmological collider physics the whole, the whole lecture. So I'll, I'll state to you the results, more or less without proof. But um, I hope that this description of the mode functions uh, will make the results look plausible. Okay. So we want to detect mass and spin. So, what, so the question is what feature in the bispectrum gives me the mass and the spin of a new field sigma. By the way, this is a, this in principle can be a very powerful uh, detector because the scale of inflation can be you know, as high as like 10 to the 13, 14 GeV. So way above uh, anything we can ever do with, uh, with the LHC. The only problem is that the experiments just run once eh, by the universe. So we have to work hard to actually see the collision. But uh, in principle, this can be very heavy, much heavier than anything we will, have, will ever have uh, access to through a collider. So M order Hubble is not really a, a, a bad problem. So for the mass, we'll break the analyticity. So we'll see uh, non-analytic behavior. around squeeze limit. And for the spin, uh, as we dial uh, the angle around the squeeze limit, we'll see a Legendre polynomial. The Legendre polynomial just follows from the fact that I, this guy carries spin, so we need to contract its polarization tensor with the momenta of the scalar fields here. So that's where the Legendre polynomial is coming from. It's just a group theory statement. So let me write a formula. Showcases. This, so the limit as k, uh, k3 going to zero of the bispectrum. is proportional, and I'm hiding the proportionality constants because it's a whole different story, how we uh, crank up and down the, we have to develop an effective field theory. The naive estimate is uh, extremely low, so you need to worry about the, how high the signal can be. But I just want to show you the feature. So I'm uh, showing it for the, um, for the principal series. So you consider a member of the principal series that is uh, slightly above this uh, bound here of order Hubble, but not much above in such a way that you just uh, kill the, the whole signal. For the principal series, we'll see oscillations. K3 over K1 to the three halves cosine M over H log k3 over k1 plus some phase, phase that, phase that is computable. So you will see oscillations, okay, as I dial. The, so the idea is that if I were to plot the bispectrum as, um, as a function of the squeezing, 
three over k one. I would see some. Uh, so the the amplitude dies off um, with uh, with some power, but. Um, it also oscillates, and the oscillation is controlled by the mass over Hubble ratio. So that's how we would measure uh, the mass of the field. So this is around the squeezed configuration. So I'm taking the triangle and making it more and more squeezed. Interesting thing is that this three halves is non-analytic behavior and it kicks in before the first uh, physical uh, contribution too. So you should see something. So if, you're, if you really have single field inflation, even if the field is heavy, okay, you should see something before you see the first analytic uh, uh, contribution coming from contact terms. Now, I mean, modulo the coefficient, of course. The coefficient of the quadratic term can be much bigger than the coefficient in front of the non-analytic term. But in terms of power counting, uh, the non-analytic term has to kick in before. For these guys here, you don't have these oscillations, but the power tells you the mass. Because the power is essentially controlled by the conformal dimension. In the extreme example of having another massless field around, uh, then actually you you will create an A naught. Remember that A naught and A one were um, essentially zero in single field inflation. So we like the, the words that people like to say is that local non Gaussianity is a signal of other light fields during inflation. Because if I have another massless field in the theory and it mediates this um, this diagram here then I'll actually generate an A naught, just because delta equals to zero. But then, as I said, you have the problem of explaining why we're not seeing the power spectrum of this uh, other field. Uh, finally, the, for the spin, uh, no question? For the spin, Um, you no, I, I think I think it's fine. You can have this guy be like uh, uh, ten times or a hundred times smaller than this. It's it's always squeezed anyway. It's just much more squeezed than here, and you pick a, a factor of two or something. Yeah, that's right. And uh, I, I forgot to put the spin information. So this will be multiplied by a Legendre polynomial. And the order of the Legendre polynomial is given by the spin in terms of uh, cosine theta. Okay. And cosine theta is, is just the, uh, if I take this triangle here, and it's very squeezed, and then I just take this angle and rotate it, then I will see Legendre polynomial behavior. So let's say I, I kind of fix the ratio, more or less, and then I dial this angle here. Then I will see Legendre polynomial behavior. So I'll see something like theta zero, 360. So if you were uh, like a um, spin two particle, then I would see, I don't know, something like this. Okay. So these, uh, these oscillations in the angular uh, for a more or less fixed ratio, squeezing ratio, these oscillations in angle give me the spin of the particle. 
and uh, the modulations as I squeeze more and more the triangle will give me the mass of the particle. So that's how I will do spectroscopy. The, the problem is, is really the, the size of the signal because there is, a, there is a e to the minus pi m over h here. And uh, if you do a weakly coupled calculation, there will be factors of slow roll. So it's like uh, really, really tiny. But you can, you can go around this, build an effective field theory like we did yesterday for the example of small speed of sound. So uh, the factor of e to the minus pi m over h you can never beat, but um, that's expected, right? Because otherwise you'd be able to probe very heavy fields and see non-analytic behavior, but we just, we just don't expect that to be possible for this reasoning that I gave here, okay? So, Questions? If uh, this field is massless, is that the question? If then, it, then you would see K3 over K1 to the zero. So you would, a, the A0 that is zero in single field inflation would be non-zero. So the uh, non-zero A naught is a sign that there is another massless field around that sources the scalar fluctuations. No, it's another field. It's not the inflaton. It's not single field inflation. You need to have another extra field that is not the inflaton itself sourcing it. Okay. It's important that the inflaton is a, is a part of the gravitational sector. So. The A naught being zero is related to the gauge symmetry of the theory. So you need another field in the game. Okay, so now I, I want to do tensors because um, if you uh, read the, the literature of the upcoming experiments in cosmology, people are pushing hard to detect tensor modes. Uh, in a sense because uh, it will teach you uh, about what is the scale at least in these vanilla models of inflation, it will really give you the ratio H over M Planck. So we will know if inflation happens at a very high scale or a very low scale. Um, so that's, and also uh, the prediction of inflation is that uh, the tensor modes also have essentially scale, quasi-scale invariant. They have a small tilt once again, but they have a, roughly speaking scale invariant power spectrum. So those are the two predictions from uh, most inflationary models. So people, people want to measure tensors in the, or at least put uh, tighter bounds on tensors in the near future, okay? So I'm gonna switch gears and do tensors for the rest of the lecture. There's the razor. So tensor modes, or primordial gravitational waves. So uh, we saw in the first two lectures that the quadratic action is just uh, that of uh, two uh, massless sc uh, scalar fields in the sitter for each polarization mode. Uh, so the, each polarization is a massless scalar, and, so, and then gamma plus k, gamma minus k, s s prime, or will be given by h squared over m Planck squared, delta s s prime. I might be missing some factors here. Cubed. So the K cubed is again associated with scale invariance. By the way, if, you, if you're finding it weird that scale invariance is related to K cubed, you can start from position space, uh, impose that the, the correlation function is the same for separations X, X prime versus lambda X, lambda X prime. Uh, 
do the Fourier transform and you'll see that it needs to go like uh, one over k cubed in, uh, in three dimensions. So, so the power spectrum, P gamma, is, so using the right definition, is uh, 2 over pi squared. And I'm, I'm using a slightly different way of uh, representing it. I think it addresses some questions uh, that were asked in the first lecture. So in this way of representing it, the, the k dependence is hidden in the, uh, the non-trivial k dependence, the tilt is hidden in the fact that h uh, varies with time. Okay, remember that we're doing inflation, not the sitter. So here, I just pick a baseline wave number, and, I calcul and I, I'm saying that I, the amplitude is measuring the Hubble parameter at this baseline wave number, and then there will be some mild dependence in the power spectrum, and I'm just stripping off the factor of k cubed to make it have no k dependence if it's uh, purely scaling variance. And the tilt is hidden here. So the tilt is controlled by the slow roll parameter, nt. So this is the tilt and um, the tensor to scalar ratio. So I'm just uh, reviewing things we did in the last lectures. P gamma over P zeta is equal to 16 epsilon. So this is just the epsilon factor that appears in the scalar action compared to the tensor action. Okay. If you look at this formula here for nt and uh, for r, then you can write this. And uh, this is kind of a nice formula. It's called the tensor consistency relation. And it's a prediction uh, of um, weakly coupled single field inflation. If we were to measure the tensor to scalar ratio, then we would have a clean prediction for the tilt, for the dependence of the power spectrum on wavelength. They should be related by a factor of minus eight. The minus is related to the, the tilt being red. So this looks nice and uh, We'll get back to this equation in a second. The interesting thing about the tensors is, of course, that the power spectrum is probing H over M Planck. Okay? So we're really measuring the scale of inflation compared to M Planck. And uh, if we see them soon, then this, this scale of inflation is actually pretty high. But it implies a problem for effective field theory. So I just want to review the problem, which is famous. So if we see them soon, then I think H is order, can be ordered 10, 10 to the 14 GeV or so. But this is goes under the name of life bound. So let's uh, estimate how much the inflaton has to roll in order to generate this tensor to, to scalar ratio. Ah, first, I must say what, what do we mean by see them soon. So the current bound, yeah, so, sorry, at the moment, R is less than 0.07 at 95% confidence level. I think this is a joint constraint from uh, the bicep experiment and Planck. But in the near future, and uh, unfortunately I can't quote the precise experiments, but in, we expect, or at least it's, this is what experimentalists say, we expect that in the five, 10 year window, R will either be detected or, or bounded by 
depending on who you ask, 10 to the minus 3, all the way to factor of a few times 10 to the minus 4. Okay? If we see anything here, then uh, one might worry about the following. So R equals 16 epsilon. So I'm just writing epsilon in slow row inflation. If you look at the at your notes from the first lecture, oh, sorry, H times dt squared divided by m Planck squared. Okay. Uh, the the amount of uh, time that elapses during inflation in units of uh, Hubble is called the number of e folds. So this is called this is d phi bar over d n number of e folds squared divided by m Planck squared. Okay. So it means that the, the inflaton field range during inflation, the amount the that the inflaton has to roll along the potential to generate this uh, R in, in Planck units is to be equal at least at least to the integral uh, from the the, uh, the E folds probe uh, from the CMB to the end of inflation. I'm just inverting this formula here. The N square root of R over H. Okay. So inflation has to stop, and we at least see this R in the CMB. So this is an approximation, of course. Uh, we, and I'm going to assume that uh, R is approximately constant during inflation, that the amount of power uh, generated along these E folds is not changed. This is an order of magnitude estimate. There are many ways around this. But, um, I think it's still useful to have it in the back of your mind. So it means that, so this is order 50, 60, whatever. So delta phi over M Planck should go like R divided by 0 0.01 to the 1 half, some coefficient. So this is called the life bound. It means that if we detect tensors in the near future, point, so we are at 0 0.07 right now. So if we push it down to like even 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 4, because this is a, a, a slowly growing function, uh, the inflaton field range is order Planck. And that's a problem, of course, because if the inflaton potential, if the higher order terms are suppressed, by the Planck scale, you need to have control over these uh, higher order corrections. So this is a problem for an effective field theorist, and uh, I guess an opportunity for a string theorist, because if this is true, then it means that it's really sensitive to the UV completion. So you need to understand the UV completion to, to some extent in order to, uh, to be sure that your model is under control and is really generating the amount of tensors that, that we see in the universe. So when BICEP uh, uh, claims that uh, it detected tensors, then there was a flurry of activity uh, in string theory because this problem uh, reappeared. And uh, there's, there's still, uh, even though it turns out that the BICEP announcement is uh, consistent with dust, uh, polarization from dust, uh, people are still uh, working in this problem in string theory. The question is, if you inflate with some uh, string, uh, some effective field coming from uh, string construction, say an axion and so on, is it possible to have a controlled UV completion for which the inflaton has a excursion of order M Planck? That's the, that's the tricky question. And uh, the claim is that, well, there are conjectures, uh, so-called, uh, weak gravity conjecture and swampland conjectures and so on, that if you apply these conjectures to the models that generate inflation, they tend to show that delta phi over M Planck is uh, always less than one. So it would be some sort of prediction of string theory that we shouldn't see tensors. It's a bit of a depressing prediction, but um, yeah. 
I think the models that have uh, everything under reasonable amount of control, they predict much lower tensor to scalar ratio. So there, the claim is that we, we won't see them in the near future. Okay. So I have, do I have uh, five minutes? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because we are measuring uh, uh, the, the tensor to scalar ratio from, for uh, the part of inflation, the modes that are generated that now affects the CMB, but we need inflation to end. And uh, as long as inflation is uh, still running, tensor modes are being created. And then we're just approximating that the same amount of power is being uh, generated for each uh, extra E-fold. So that's... Uh, you can change, you can, uh, you can uh, th yeah, there are ways around this, but it's just a rule of thumb, just order of magnitude estimates. Now, I, I really want to tell you something about, um, about this formula, R equals minus 8 and T, because uh, if you're, at the, if from the point of view of DSCFT, it, it smells uh, uh, kind of tantalizing. Actually, I'll give you an explanation and then I'll tell you that it's wrong. Um, but, um, so if you look at this, let me, I need to write down the formula for... So if you recall from yesterday's lecture, so the, the power spectrum of the scalars is like one over uh, two times real the stress tensor two-point function, but the trace, I, I, J, J, and the gamma, gamma two-point function, traceless transverse, okay? So if we are in a pure CFT, let's say the SCFT exists, okay? So if I'm in an in a actual conformal field theory, then this thing is non-zero, I have gravitational waves, but uh, it doesn't make sense to talk about uh, scalar fluctuations. Okay? I, I need to have some breaking of conformal symmetry. I need to introduce this clock field in order to generate scalar fluctuations. And so it means that um, the amplitude of scalar fluctuations is controlled by the trace of the stress tensor, which we know is zero in a conformal field theory. So a way to uh, move away from the conformal fixed point is to slightly deform the conformal field theory. So let's say we do conformal perturbation theory. So we, we start from a fixed point and add to the Lagrangian uh, uh, a, a slightly relevant uh, operator. And then we see how it corrects both this guy and this guy. So if you look at this formula here, R is controlled by the generation of a trace. So once I have a trace, then I'll have non-zero R. Agree? Because uh, then I'll have a non-zero scalar power spectrum and I can take this ratio. So I have generated R the moment that I generate a, a trace two-point function. But also because I deformed the CFT, then I expect the gravitons to acquire some anomalous dimension. Not to have, so in a, in a conformal field theory, TT in uh, three dimensions is just going to go like K cubed. So it's going to be precisely scale invariant. So I'm going to induce some small anomalous dimension. And then you stare at this and you say, okay, if I do conformal perturbation theory, theory I'll generate both R and NT. And then it would be beautiful if I do it for a generic uh, perturbation that I always get the factor of minus eight. But uh, this doesn't work. So the, I, I, I was like, okay, this has to work, <laughs> but it doesn't. What happens is that uh, to leading order in conformal perturbation theory, you actually generate the tilt first, and you don't generate the, the, the trace two-point function. To generate the trace two-point function, you have to go to second order in conformal perturbation theory. But to leading order in conformal perturbation theory, you do generate the tilt. So, if this formula is not true, then uh, 
it means that inflation must be in some sense stringy. In a way that I'll be happy to tell you uh, offline because uh, I'm over time. But um, from the point of view of uh, DSCFT, it's a pretty neat thing because um, it implies that there are some higher derivative terms that in principle could be relevant and affect the tilt. So let me, let me step back and repeat the claim. If we see, first we have to measure R, but then we're bold and let's measure NT. And let's say that R and NT are not related by a factor of minus H. It's very different. Let's say it's like, I don't know, minus four or minus three, okay? Or even a crazy uh, case in which this flip sign is called the blue tilt. So if this happens, it means that inflation, uh, actually the derivative expansion is breaking down for the gravitational sector. And one ne really needs to use something like DSCFT to make sense of inflation. And uh, we're really probing higher derivative uh, operators. And, but there's a very clean and nice way of understanding this from the SCFG. So now I'm just advertising the results. But um, so this formula, in a sense, can probe whether inflation in the gravitational sector was weakly or strongly coupled. That's the claim. If it was strongly coupled, then I claim that this uh, formula can be completely changed. If it was weakly coupled, then this formula should be correct, and we should see the factor of minus eight. So once again, uh, it's like a, a probe of, uh, of the high energy completion of inflation. So the reason why tensor modes are exciting is really because it, it, they're very UV sensitive. So it's a, it's a nice opportunity um, to test the, the playgrounds of ideas from string theory. So yeah, with that, Sorry I went over time, but let me stop and thank you for your attention. Thank you.